Hi there, I'm David Harvey, and I'm here with John Andrews, and this is the Two Texts Podcast. In this podcast, we're two friends in two different countries, here every two weeks talking about two different texts from the Bible. This is our second series about the miracles of Jesus. And today you're listening to episode 10, and it's called Suddenly a Woman. So David, we are in our wonderful miracle series, and in our previous episode, we looked at the raising of the widow's son in Luke chapter 7, and we referenced then that this actually was part of four unique miracles in the Gospel of Luke Mm -hmm. that are all about margins. And here in Luke 13, we have the second of those four, and it's got a woman at the centre of the story again. So so uh, we've got this beautiful story of the healing of a woman in a synagogue and uh, we're picking this up at Luke chapter 13 verse 10. Do you want to do you want to read that for us? Yes, absolutely I do. And so Luke chapter 13. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. (laughs) Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, I'm sorry, John. I'm laughing at this story because it is just quite something, isn't it? (laughs) It is quite something. I'm just trying to imagine being in this situation and deciding to come back with this comment. So indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work. So come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath from what bound her? And when he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Wow. Yes. Yes. Overcome with uh, the sense of humour and irony within yes. that. It is, a, it is a, a fascinating, fascinating story. Not just, of course, because of the miracle itself, which, my goodness, that will keep us occupied for a while. But the reaction to it, yes. the reaction is uh, quite staggering. And of course, uh, some of our listeners may know some of the backstory as to why yes. that might be the case, but but we, we may need to unpack that a little bit. Why on earth would a synagogue ruler be giving off at Jesus because he heals on the Sabbath? But yeah. but but my goodness, what a what a story here of recovery. Again, leaning into our idea of margins, David, this mm. this woman has undoubtedly been marginalized for the guts of two decades. Mm. So whatever specifically her ailment is it has undoubtedly Mm. marginalized her from her society and yet strikingly she finds herself uh in a place where jesus is and and i find that little part of that really fascinating within this I, i i in in my niv version of the bible it, it sort of says that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. And then the, verse 11 says, and a woman was there. So so this is where I'm, I'm going to start with a bit of a challenge on this. Because I, again, I love the NIV. So please, my goodness, the scholarship that's gone into that is amazing. And mm. I am a pygmy in comparison to these amazing scholars. So w- what I'm about to say, I say with care. But I think that's an unhelpful translation for a, for a number of reasons. Mm-hmm. I, I think if you look at the sort of more literalness of the translation, it could read, and behold a woman. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I think now, I think that's absolutely in line with the context because the context is she's been 18 years sick, mm-hmm. 
18 years unclean, Mm -hmm. 18 years marginalized. Now, if you were living for 18 years on the margins of your society, I'm fairly certain you wouldn't be rocking up to the one place in your village that's going to constantly remind you that you are unclean. And I have a theory that she's not there at the start of the synagogue service, but she appears as Jesus gets up to speak. Now, I've done a Mm. wee bit of research on this in terms of, because I think that's nuanced in the text, right? But but I think the synagogue service itself leans into this. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the order of the synagogue service, there were sort of uh, six elements to it. Okay, so you get element number one, the litany. So that was a series of prayers, blessing God for his love towards his people. Then you would have the, you'd move into the confession, confessing God's faithfulness and our sin. Then we would move into intercessory prayer related to that confession Then a scripture reading from whatever part of the law of the prophets Mm -hmm. we were in at that point. And then, then the teaching discourse. Okay. Mm. That's element number five. Element number six is the benediction. Okay. So, so, so element number five. Now imagine this, David. So Jesus gets up to teach and then she appears. Mm. Okay. Now, if you're prepared to read it like that, then the the next bit sort of where it says, having seen her, exactly the same phraseology. If our listeners have heard our previous uh, podcast where Mm. it he, having seen the widow, Mm. we've got the same sort of language, having seen her. Mm -hmm. Now, there's two ways to interpret that. He's either seen her because she's in the synagogue from the beginning Or, Mm. as he gets up to speak, she appears at the door, Mm -hmm. having seen her. Now, that that's my sort of dramatic introduction. That's as most uh, most dramatic I could be. (laughs) It's my most dramatic introduction to this story because I think this is dramatic. I Mm -hmm. think this is why the synagogue rulers reacting. Not just because of the healing, but because, hold on a moment, this woman is in our synagogue and something's going on here. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a deeply, deeply uncomfortable moment because she suddenly appears. Maybe she hears the young rabbi who's who's just bringing the kingdom is in her synagogue and she rocks up to the door, bent over, maybe not even in the synagogue, but standing at the door and seeing her. Mm. And, And I... I think, David, that's, I hope I'm not stretching that too far, but I think that's there. I, I, And I think the translation of, and a woman was there, almost gives the impression she's been there from the beginning. And I am suggesting she's not. Mm-hmm. I think she comes in as Jesus teaches because she's turning up for Jesus, mm-hmm. having been a marginalized, unclean woman for almost two decades. Mm-hmm. Does that does that sit with you, or am I out there on a limb? What, what what do you reckon? I think you're 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 right. I mean, I, I, you've not said anything negative about translators, right? And, and I mean, and you can read about this extensively online if anyone was ever interested. There are various theories around translation, not just in terms of how do you translate words, but what approach are you taking to translate the word? The, the two approaches are word for word way of translation and then there's what they call dynamic equivalence and often people like you and me we get questions after church services all the time what's the best translation (laughs) Mm -hmm. and of course the question of what's the best translation is hugely complex isn't it because well what do you mean by best and some people assume that word for word translation is best but quite a few times word for word translation would be unintelligible right? because yeah. word order works differently and the other problem is sometimes words carry multiple meanings don't they so so it's like how do you make the choice to decide what word to translate mm. let me just throw this as an example john three sixteen: for god so loved mm. the world and we always tend to think of that is that so loved is a way of saying this is how much god loved the world so much yeah. right so means so much but in the greek it could also mean this is the way that God loved the world. Right? Mm-hmm. So it could, it couldn't, it might not mean volume. It might mean manner or or method. Yeah. 
Now, my suspicion is that John in John 3.16 means both of those things. <laughs> God loved yes. the world so much that he loved the world this way. But as a translator, you kind of just have to make a decision as to which one am yeah. I going to sort of lean towards. So you yeah. you know this, John, but I think it's worth always bearing that in mind. That's why it's really important if you want to study text properly that actually having several translations is really helpful to see how do the other translators deal with the nuances on this text. So all of that then to say that, that a lot of the English translations break up this passage in kind of unusual ways, right? So that in the NIV, it's a run-on sentence from verse 10 through verse 11. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who'd been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. But your Greek sentence structure goes, Jesus was one of those. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Then the new sentence begins, behold, <laughs> a woman yes. who had a spirit mm -hmm. of uncleanness for, for mm -hmm. 18 years and, and was bent over, it says. And, and, and that's all one sentence. So, so, the, so the Greek sentence goes, behold, a woman. Who, who had a spirit of illness for 18 mm -hmm. years, was bent over and couldn't straighten up at all. It kind of groups it all in together. But there's yep. definitely yep. the drama of the passage, John, is there. It's this, this the Greek, kai it do, it, it's, a, it's a punchy start to a sentence. It's, yeah. and, and I yeah. think you're, if you were, how would I say it? If John, <laughs> I don't know where John came from. If Luke <laughs> was writing <laughs> stage notes, there would yeah. be this would be the entrance of the woman. Behold, a woman, she's there. And you see it, you see it in a few of the texts. Um, you see the language of this often happens when demons appear. It's like behold a demon. And, and behold, yeah. somebody was there. It, it definitely implies something has shifted in the narrative. Something has someone has yeah. appeared just now and, and and it's it's different, right? So I am completely yeah. endorsing and it's sorry for the long rant about about no, translation. It's good. It's good. But I think it's important for us to know that that when we in a show like this will sometimes critique translation, we're not saying this translation is terrible. And, and even the translators themselves will tell you translation is just one part. There's a lot of exploration has to go on. So it's good study and research to look at other translations, to read some commentaries and to see, okay, okay, it's not that this translation was trying to obscure things. It's just they, they made decisions to try and make it read well for us. And for sure. we grew up, we've all got that friend who says, well, it was a really good movie, but you need to watch it in the original language with subtitles because it's better. <laughs> and we're like, what? Okay. And, and maybe we're those friends for you just now that are going, okay, there's just more here. Go and spend a little bit of time looking after it. But can I jump yeah. in onto that, John? Is this language Please. of uncertainty in the vulnerability here. Behold a woman who'd been crippled by a spirit of weakness, a disabling mm. spirit. Asthenio is is, is, is is some sort of incapacity for 18 years. I, I read that as 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 Luke and way of saying, we don't actually really know what's wrong with this lady, right? So there's something affecting her that our current medical knowledge can't make sense of. It's interesting, actually, for me, Luke chapter 13, 10 through um, 17 that we're looking at today is one of the passages that helps you realize that Luke really was a doctor. Some of his language yeah. is, is f for its time, quite precise medical observations that he's making. But but this language of, of a spirit of, and again, I'm not trying to suggest that it's very clear in the story that there's something evil is impacting this lady. But from the observer's point of view, this lady is bent over and can't straighten up and we don't yeah. know why. <laughs> Actually, yeah. something beyond us is, is affecting mm -hmm. her. Uh, so there's real intense yeah. vulnerability here that I think is just worth noting for the story. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, and I think that, that if you imagine the image of that vulnerability mm. leans into the dramaticness of this moment. So this woman's not hiding. She's, if she's bent over double and can't straighten up, mm. So, so whether you believe she's already in the synagogue or if you're going to sort of follow our breadcrumbs and lean into the fact she might be appearing at the door or mm. at least making some sort of entrance at that stage. It's not just dramatic because she's turning up. It's dramatic because she can't straighten up. Mm. She's bent over double. So she will be 
in many ways sort of creaking her neck to strain at those gathered in the synagogue and look at Jesus. So, so you have, I mean, even the physicality of her illness shows profound. I mean, imagine having to walk around bent over mm. and not being able to straighten up. I mean, just, just doing everyday stuff and meeting people who don't understand what's going on in your world and thinking, mm. what's, what on earth is he doing? What on earth is, why is she behaving like that? And somehow, somehow this, vulnerability is exasperated by her physical expression as well as the must be the profound sense of hopelessness in her that this has been going on for 18 years for some of our listeners literally that's a lifetime some of our listeners will be 18 19 20 years of age that's a whole life Mm. spent bent double and and undoubtedly has probably sought every cure under the sun that she can afford to get this thing fixed and it's not fixing so so the the overwhelming sense of the woman's vulnerability is is absolutely there and you can also get a sense of why this this woman would find herself excluded mm. this is just it's not just it's not just difficult in terms of uncleanness it's it's difficult in terms of just like social dynamic. This is awkward. Yes. And you're dealing with someone who seems to have a profound disability uh, in a world that probably wouldn't be known for its understanding mm. in a sympathetic way of, of that disability. Maybe nuanced in there as well. She's like this because God's cursed her. Yes. Or she's like this because she sinned. I mean, that that was part of the theological framework of the day of Jesus. And Jesus, uh, on numerous occasions, literally refutes that. It's really interesting. Dr. Luke hits this out of the park right at the beginning of his gospel when he talks about Zechariah and Elizabeth being barren, that, that, that even when they could have children, they couldn't have children, and now they're old in years. And it says, but Dr. Luke reminds us, but they were righteous people. Mm. And it's really interesting. He hits that right at the beginning because he's saying to, to his audience, OK, Elizabeth is not barren because she's a sinner. Elizabeth was a righteous person. Mm. Zechariah was a good man because John 9, we've touched on this. Who sinned mm. that this man was born blind? So, so there was a theology attached to suffering that wasn't always helpful to mm-hmm. the sufferer. So you've got layers layers of suffering in this woman, 18 years of suffering, the physicality of that suffering, the vulnerability of that suffering, the exclusion of that suffering, and layered on top of that, the very synagogue she's standing in would probably have a theological position that says, mm. oh, and by the way, you probably deserve it mm. because you've been a bad person somewhere in your life. And if all of that's the case, I'm not surprised you didn't rock up to the synagogue too often. It's definitely there in the text, isn't it? The fact that the the definition of what's wrong with her is it's a spirit. At least somebody's commentary on this is this is not, she didn't fall down the stairs and and ended up with this. Mm. So yeah, living with that shame and, and and that theology can, that theology persists, John, you still can encounter that theology in the contemporary world, wherein, despite the consistent message of the Bible refuting that way of thinking, <laughs> there's still a, a, a dominant amount of thinking I encounter in, in, in Christendom of, well, maybe you deserve it. And, that, and so there's always that shame. There's always that shame. We find it. People encounter tragedy and so quickly our theology leads us to ask the questions, but what did I do to end up in this sort of situation? And so, Indeed. Indeed. so, so Jesus is is definitely going to want to contrast some of that with us. And so, so then he sure. sets something up, John, that I want to just pause because the miracle itself is relatively straightforward, isn't it? Here's the woman. She had a spirit uh, for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't straighten up. Jesus saw her and called her forward. So as you said, the grammar's there is the seeing and the calling. He brings her forward. Women, you're set free from your infirmity. I mean, that it's it's a it's a two-line miracle story, isn't it? Yep. And, and then he put his hands on her. Interesting, there's touch here. We talked about in the yes. last episode how Jesus talks to the dead man and doesn't touch her, doesn't touch him. Mm. But here in this story, Jesus says you're set free, and then he touches her. But what I just want to highlight, because I think we need to, bank this little comment here 
woman, you are set free. And it's just worth putting in the bank right there that again, not a bad translation, but the literal word that's used mm -hmm. is this Greek word, which is the Greek root is the word luo, which means yep. to loose. Right. So, loose. so it is an absolutely valid translation to say, woman, you're set free. But if you're a Bible highlighter, you're just going to want to highlight that word and say, but the literal word there is luo, which means to loose. Anyone that's ever learned Greek will all of a sudden jump on board with this because luo is the very first Greek word that you're ever taught in most Greek uh, textbooks because it's a verb that works consistently. It, it has no irregularities mm. to it. So even if you did lesson one of Greek verbs, you'll go, oh, I, I know that word. I know that <laughs> word. So I just want to bank that, John, that, that the woman is loosed. Jesus says you are loosed from your infirmity because yep. that's going to be helpful to us as, yep. as we jump into the rest of the story, Absolutely. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good, and and of course, in getting to that moment, we we have some dramatic pro uh, progressions here. Mm. So, although the, the the miracle is relatively, if we can say this carefully, relatively straightforward. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Yeah, relatively straightforward. There are a number of sort of dramatic developments from mm. verses twelve to thirteen that are really worthy of our note. Mm. In that he calls her forward now, mm. my goodness now two two things to think about there david number one she's the one with the disability <laughs> right yes so wh why why doesn't jesus go to her I, I mean i mean he's gone to the to the to the the beer before we in in luke 7 mm. he went to the beer and touched the the the, the beer that the boy was standing on uh, or or lying on and and healed him so Jesus, go, but Jesus makes her come to him. And I think there's two things going on. I, I I, think it's not just that Jesus isn't going to her. I think that Jesus is deliberately calling her towards mm -hmm. the place of the Torah, the place that is getting dangerously close to her being within touching distance of of that scroll mm. and of that that gallery that mm. perhaps the religious experts and wow. the leader of the synagogue is sitting in yes. so so Jesus calls her forward uh, and and isn't that a beautiful picture in Luke Amazing. remember our margin stuff he is calling her from the margin mm. if she has appeared at the door He's literally, he's literally calling her from the door and he's saying, come here to me. Yes. Come to the center, the center of this synagogue. Don't sit on the fringe because what I'm about to do is going to deliver you from the fringes for the rest of your life. It's just a, it's an easy miss again, rushing to the punchline of the miracle. Mm. It's really easy to miss that little calls her forward which is just just beautiful. It's just like if you're going to read anything in Luke's gospel, I mean, read Luke's gospel, read Luke's gospel again and again and again. That's my advice to anybody. Keep reading Luke's gospel. <laughs> and, uh, but when you are going to read Luke's gospel, always just go to chapter one. And if you've got, and if you've got time, just read the Magnificat, Mary's song, mm -hmm. and read Good Zechariah's story. prophecy because it's like... <laughs> Here's what I think Luke does. I mean, those two pieces of pr prophetic text are profound, but L Luke puts them at the beginning of his book, and it's equivalent to uh, this is how I want to say it, John. Because I like it, you know me, I like a good metaphor. And um, you sit down to your math exam, <laughs> and you open up page one of your math exam, and by some fluke, the answers are stuck in the first page, <laughs> and and you all of a sudden realize. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I now know the answers to all the questions in this test, right? I would be tempted to say that in Mary's song and Zechariah's prophecy, all of the answers to understanding what Luke thinks is happening in his gospel are there. Mm. And in Mary's song, there's this great power reversal. In Zechariah's oh, song, the mercy is shown to the downtrodden. Mary says the rich and the powerful are brought down from their thrones and the poor are yes. lifted up. So this miracle story is a power struggle. It's a power struggle between between the synagogue powers and their ability to enact the, the law in particular ways and between Jesus' kingdom, which wants to enact the law 
very differently, right? So I think it's always worth, like I say, this little little detour on how to read Luke's gospel. But these these two poems, these two prophecies, these two prayers are are just constantly being alluded to throughout, aren't they? It's so good. And isn't it beautiful, David, that the two opening prophecies represent in some ways the dynamic tension Jesus is trying to reach throughout the Gospel of Luke. So Zechariah represents the sort of religious, priestly, in-house crowd order. And of course, you get Jesus tussling with the Pharisees, sitting, having dinner with them, desperately trying to win them, while they are trying to win him, I suppose. And then you've got you've got Mary's words, which are this power juxtaposition coming out of the mouth of a teenage girl. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, it so doesn't good. get any better than that. And if you didn't, if you read Mary's Magnificat and didn't know who said that, you'd think that was coming a profound scholar, mm. uh, a well-educated, top quality Old Testament expert. And it's coming out of the mouth of the equivalent in our culture of a teenage oh, girl. God. Goodness, goodness, John. Like so much I agree with you. I'm so excited by a conversation like this. Because because here's here's what here's, we're getting off track, John, but I'm super I'm super excited that you've mentioned but it's this. Good. It's a good off track. Keep going, keep going. I, I go so often to Christmas shows, right? My wife was a teacher in a uh, in a Christian school for a lot of years in a in a Roman Catholic school. My daughter uh, is involved in, in stuff. We go to nativity plays in churches. Like, I've seen, and you're the same. Like, I think if you've pastored yeah, yeah. in the church, you've seen a lot of nativity plays in your time. <laughs> and I get so frustrated by the portrayal of Mary in oh, yeah. all of them. I've been to Roman Catholic nativity shows. Right, I've been to Pentecostal ones. Mary is always cast as this shy, retiring not quite sure what's going on, timid little girl. <laughs> and then you read Luke. And then I think Luke is um, the great gospel liberator of women, right? Like if, if, if there is a gospel writer, I think they all do it. But Luke rails against patriarchy, right? In but you read sure. Mary and Luke, like, goodness, like she is... Hey, let me say this, and, and I'm, we might lose some listeners with this uh, with this metaphor, but let me just say like this. If Mary is a little teenage girl, she's a Greta Thunberg type teenage girl, you yeah. know, yeah. this Greta Thunberg, this, this, and I know that she's yeah. a politically uh, polarizing figure, but this teenage girl who's happy to go to the UN and talk to them about what she thinks is right, that's the type of teenage girl that Mary is. Like she's, she's, yeah. she's going to put it out there and say this, this child is God bringing down the, the powerful and raising up the poor. I, I mean, it's, well, you can tell I'm excited about it, John. But, but, oh, but like, yeah. this is my appeal. If you're a pastor listening to this, no more nativity plays with Mary as this little girl that doesn't know what's going on. Absolutely, and and maybe maybe do a sermon series at Christmas on the Magnificat. Yes. that'll that'll keep us all occupied for a little while. It, oh, it is just. it is just gorgeous. So so he he, he calls her forward mm. this dramatic moment. Then, then it's, it's this thing is like it's gathering momentum. He calls mm. her forward. Now he speaks to her. We'll, we'll, I think we'll come back because there's a gorgeous, humorous connector mm. to Loosed later on in the passage, which mm-hmm. I think you're alluding to. Yes. And then, of course, he touched her. Now, yeah. now here's the thing, right? She's bent over mm. to touch her. <laughs> He's got to bend down. Mm. Right? So... We've seen already in chapter 7 of Luke and in other miracle stories that we've Mm. encountered that Jesus doesn't need to touch anybody to heal them. Mm. Mm. He doesn't touch the boy that he raises from the dead. He touches the beer. He doesn't uh, touch the servant of the centurion in Luke 7. Mm. He speaks the word. So we know he doesn't need to touch her. He's touching her Mm. deliberately. He... And to touch her, he has to bend over to, even if Jesus is of average height, Mm. okay, he's having to bend over. And and note it, he put his hands on her. Mm. So this isn't just like a little, little sort of casual, glancy, touchy thing. This is Jesus putting both his hands on her and bending over Mm to do that and this 
I think this is, as far as Luke is concerned, pro- programmatically, this is this is the glory of heaven touching the brokenness of humanity mm. in a synagogue within touching distance of the Torah. <laughs> I, it, it's just doesn't get much better than this in terms of that. And, and also it's shocking moment. It mm. is a sh- I think it's this moment of touching that really irritates the people there, not not just the healing, but the behavior of Jesus. I think mm. it's the behavior of Jesus as much as the healing is irritating the powers that be mm. within that synagogue setting. But this is dramatic. It doesn't need to touch her. In fact, it would be wiser not to touch her. Mm. But he bends over and touches her anyway, yeah. because he's making, again, as we've been trying to reemphasize over and over again in our miracle series, this is not just about the miracle. There is a message in the miracle. There's a message, not just of liberation from sickness, there's something else often being nuanced Mm. in this. And I think that touching moment is profoundly dramatic in the healing of this woman. Of course, Luke then says, immediately, contrasting it to the 18 years of suffering, immediately, Mm, she straightened up. Do you know, it's it's just, so you get this sort of building. He saw her, Mm. he calls her forward, he speaks to her, then he touches her, and boom, now he heals her. And then it all kicks off, of course, mm. in the context of the synagogue in terms of that unbelievably strange, weird reaction, at least to us <laughs> in the 21st century. Yeah. It seems like a very strange reaction. It does, doesn't it? But and of course, that's what Luke set up right at the very start of his gospel, is that is that Jesus has come to disrupt, that Jesus is a disruptor. Mm. And this whole story is disruptive. But it's always worth bearing in mind that disruption threatens people. That, that I, I think we said this in an earlier um, episode. But I am always aware of the fact that if you think about the Magnificat, and Mary talks about the, 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 the valleys being raised up, the poor are being yeah. lifted up. Oh, that's brilliant, we say. But the mechanism that Mary seems to allude to is, is how are we going to raise up these valleys well, we're going to raise up these valleys by pushing this mountain into them. There, there's a there's a huge road project going on outside of my house at the minute, and uh, where they're they're connecting a ring road through our city. And the the work my daughter and I, when we drive to school, like they are quite literally moving sections of of hills. They're they're, they're currently putting they're currently punching through a hill, and they're taking all of this mud from this hill and they're moving it down into a section of the valley, so that basically they can build a road where there was a valley through where there was a hill. Well. Mary yeah. says that the the valleys will be raised up. Well, to raise the valleys up, you have to raise, you have to lower the, the mountains. Well, to raise up the poor, you have to ask the rich to step down a little bit. I mean, this yeah. is disruption yeah. on a level. So when you hear a message like the Magnificat, if you're poor, it sounds hopeful. If you're rich, mm. it sounds threatening. Um, and yeah. and and so. So it's no surprise when Jesus walks into the power structure of his day and starts to do things which are disruptive, it's threatening. It's threatening to livelihoods and to careers and to systems. And and, and, and listen, if you've been in church for more than five minutes, we can all get very, very, very protective about even just tradition. <laughs> it's just not of the course. way we do it around here. And we can all fall yeah, out yeah. in whether you're in a church or a golf club somebody suggests doing something differently, it's a risky strategy that you've just taken on. For sure. So so sure. I, I feel like this, you're seeing it's important to don't just read this as this man's mad because Jesus did a miracle. The synagogue leader understands what the miracle implies. The synagogue yeah, yeah. leader realizes like this disruption could, could be bad for me. Um, mm-hmm. And therefore... I, I always like to say within Jesus, and it's so often that the story and the argument seems to be about this, but actually it's about that. <laughs> so it seems like yes. the complaint is about this woman being healed, but actually the complaint's about so much more than that. <laughs> I think so. But as even when I was reading it, though, John, it's like it's hard to read it without even sniggering because it just seems so far fetched. <laughs> like there are six well, well, days for work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and 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 even if you if you'd have been in that synagogue and understood the sort of epicenter of that argument, mm-hmm. and th- there was reason for the argument, but 
But even if you sort of understand that, you're going, but hold on a minute, he's just healed her. She, <laughs> this woman's been hobbling around for 18 years. Like, seriously, that, that's that's got to be God, right? <laughs> and of course, some of our, our listeners may may wonder what on earth provokes this reaction. I, I do think there's a power shift happening. And I think the minute someone comes in, and we see this with Jesus and Lazarus in John's gospel, mm-hmm. literally the raising of Lazarus from the dead, causes the religious community who have influence and power to to aggressively intensify their agenda mm. to destroy Jesus and Lazarus, actually. Mm. So there is a power shift taking place because of some of these miracles, which is definitely a backstory that's going on here. But of course, his 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 response is not from the Torah. So there's nothing in the Torah that I can find that forbids being healed on Shabbat. Okay. <laughs> but of course, what is forbidden on Shabbat is work. So you enter into rest. And so uh, our listeners may be aware of the fact that a, an oral tradition amongst the scholars, the teachers, has in which they discuss what does keeping the Sabbath look like. So within oral traditions that ultimately get wrapped into things like the Mishnah and are fed by things like the Gemara, it, it, you have these ideas. OK, can, can I take my donkey to the water or not? Can I can I walk on the Sabbath or not? Can I do this or not? Uh, mm-hmm. What can I do? What can't I do? And even today, if you go to modern Israel, when it enters into Shabbat, literally elevators in, in hotels stop and they go on to a special sort of bypass system. And there's all sorts of mm-hmm. things you, you still can't do because healing was seen as creative work. Mm-hmm. So that's why there's a reaction here. Now, it doesn't make any sense because a healing of a broken body is the ultimate demonstration of the grace of God Mm -hmm. in a broken world. But somehow there was a nuance that said healing is is not permitted on the Sabbath because healing is work. And this is what makes Jesus' response magnificent. Jesus understands the synagogue ruler is not arguing from the Torah because if he did, he wouldn't have a leg to stand on. Mm. But he's arguing from the oral tradition. Mm. And this is where the genius of Jesus is seen again, because Jesus doesn't respond from the Torah. Mm. Jesus responds from the oral tradition. And he actually says, but hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Don't don't you say that you can loose your donkey and, and bring it to the water <laughs> on the Sabbath? He says, he goes on to say, then should not this woman be loosed. So that lovely introduction that you gave us a little while ago about that he doesn't just heal the woman, he looses the woman. I think Dr. Luke is setting us up for a gorgeous little play on that yes. that idea later on, which is a dramatic epicenter to the argument. Well, hold on. The oral tradition says that we can loose our donkey and take it to the water. And here's And here's what Jesus is saying. Hey, Luke, if it's good enough to loose a donkey, it's okay to loose the woman, right? <laughs> now, when you, I mean, it's such a brilliant argument. And he's, he's not even quoting Moses. He's not even quoting Torah. He's not, he's not violating Shabbat. Mm-hmm. It's a genius answer without, without bringing the wrath of the law on his head. Mm-hmm. He literally sort of pokes fun at the oral interpretation. The, more, the, the, the oral interpretation says, well, donkeys, you can loose women, you can't. And Jesus said, come on, boys. I mean, without saying it, he said, is that preposterous or am I the only one in the room that thinks that's the case? Yes. So so it's a brilliant response and it shows again the genius of Jesus. He didn't just know Moses. He yeah. knew the arguments about Moses and he was able to lean into some of those yes. and and help establish the kingdom's authority in those interpretations. Of course, this idea of, of Mishnah is, is a fence, isn't it? That, that we don't want hmm. to break the law. So what we'll do is we'll put a fence around the law. So we'll put laws on top of laws. And therefore, if we can keep those laws, we're definitely in no danger of breaking Torah. But mm. it's interesting that, that Jesus, even the contrast he makes about time is interesting. Doesn't each of you on Sabbath loose? And like you say, it's that word there. We translated untie. But again, the word is actually yeah. loose. Doesn't doesn't each of loose. you on the Sabbath yeah. loose your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Well, think of the contrast. Why does your ox or donkey need water? Well, because it's not had anything to drink since yesterday. And the, yeah. so Jesus is contrast. So you will loose a donkey that's less than 24 hours thirsty. 
but you don't want to lose an 18 oh, year so long <laughs> illness. <laughs> So good. I'd never seen that before. That's so good. <laughs> You're telling me that a thirsty donkey <laughs> is more important than a broken woman? <laughs> it's like Come on. The, the, the time contrast is really interesting, isn't it? <laughs> it's fantastic. I'd never seen that before. That's, that's just fab. Love that. I love that. And and again, it's almost slightly humorous as well, isn't it? It's like they're, they're, you do feel it when Jesus is answering this. I know mm-hmm. I've been watching uh, the recent release series, The Chosen, mm-hmm. and, and what they have Jesus doing every now and again is at really key moments, Jesus winks <laughs> uh, and he winks at people. And it's it's a bit it's a bit gloriously disturbing, but I do like the idea of Jesus winking. Mm-hmm. And I could almost you could almost see Jesus as he's about to answer the synagogue ruler winking at the woman just stand there watch this yeah. as he as he then dismantles mm. the argument um with such profundity and of course this is a serious point that you made earlier on david and this is this is genuinely now landing this in seriousness is that of course it it actually does say that his opponents were humiliated mm. now that's a serious issue there so the people rejoiced but his opponents were humiliated mm. and i think they're humiliated because he has, without trying very hard, completely dismantled their interesting, mm. we'll call it theological position mm-hmm. on Shabbat, as far as healing is concerned. And listen, no one likes to have their backside kicked in public. Mm. So I, I do think you're getting a disturbance of the power structure here. I think this miracle will rumble. I think the way Jesus behaves here will rumble out. And I think you're starting to get a momentum building towards this climactic moment of clash in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is starting to rattle cages, not simply by what he's doing, but by challenging some of the profound traditions that some of these ideas are built on, which are not necessarily biblical Mm -hmm. ideas but traditions Mm -hmm. of elders and scholars yes no i i i definitely agree and and that transition of the the great reversal is at the start of the story although it's implicit we have detected it there there is the shame of the woman right and now at the end of the story it's the shame of the opponents so you see again it's again it's this it's this magnificat paradigm isn't it it's mary's song mm. it's inverting mm. the people who are glorified are, are are not so glorified and the people who are shamed are now being are now being presented as models mm. of the kingdom of god indeed and it's it's striking it's striking one, one last little just reflection on that bit david it's striking that Jesus uh, calls them hypocrites. Mm. Now, we, we tend to think that word gets banded around a lot in the Gospels, but actually in the Gospels, as far as I can see, hypocrite is only used 18 times, mm-hmm. according to my research. And it's only used by Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of the 18 times Jesus uses it, 15 are really directed to the religious community. So it's not a word he uses liberally. Mm-hmm. It's a word he really uses in focused language, and it does tend to be the majority of the use towards people who should know better. So what he's really, when he calls this man a hypocrite, he's actually saying, come on now, you should know better than this. You you are taking me on in public and forcing me to take, to take you on. Mm-hmm. And actually you're being a hypocrite because you've taken your donkey out to water on Shabbat. Mm-hmm. Well, well, why can't we lose this woman? So, so again, for our listeners, the word hypocrite gets thrown around a lot. And I, actually, it's used very carefully in the Gospels. Mm-hmm. And Jesus uses it very carefully and almost entirely for the religious uh, community. And and again, the, and this is why I picked this up, David, the little contrast where you talk about that contrast, of that reversal of position. Mm-hmm. This is then emphasized. So he calls them in verse 15, hypocrites. Mm-hmm. And then he refers to the woman as the daughter of Abraham. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now there's a juxtaposition. Mm-hmm. So the synagogue ruler and his mates are called hypocrites. Mm-hmm. And the broken woman who's been unclean for 18 years is called the daughter of Abraham. And again, a little reflection for our listeners. This is the only time in the whole of the Gospels. Mm. And I, as far as I can see, the whole of the scriptures where a woman is referred to directly 
as a daughter mm -hmm. of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is not just healing her. He's not just straightening her up physically. He is straightening her up in her identity. Mm -hmm. He is lifting her up. He has lifted her from unclean, marginalized, that woman who's been sick and probably deserves to be sick to daughter of Abraham. Mm. And that, uh, to me, that is a magnificent moment mm. where hypocrite and daughter of Abraham sit in opposition yeah. to one another dramatically in this story. And I think that probably leans into the humiliation and the delight. If you're sitting there as, as not very well educated, feeling a bit on the margin yourself, and you're hearing this local rabbi mm. giving these boys a bit of a kicking in terms of theology, you're probably quietly delighted in all of that <laughs> but you're, you're seeing a dramatic juxtaposition here mm. hypocrite daughter of abraham absolutely beautiful within that so i, I just grabbed that yeah. after what you had said there i thought it was just a great little and it's important drink. it's important to note and, and just maybe just keep repeating that this isn't jesus has in modern interpretation is sometimes accused of a bit of anti-semitism by the arguments that he has with some of the, the synagogue leaders. But I, I always feel like it's important to note at this point that, that Jesus isn't criticizing Judaism. He isn't criticizing no. Torah. He is, he no. never, as far as I can see, breaks Torah. He, no. he, he stays well within Jesus is Jewish and, and he holds under that. What he is critiquing here which is very common actually within uh, Judaism to be internally critical. But Jesus is critiquing yeah. here, you are actually off beam with Torah. You have put things in front of yeah. Torah, which are now preventing Torah from being lived out here. Uh, Sabbath is for humans, <laughs> not humans yeah. for Sabbath. So if donkeys can have exceptions on Sabbath, surely also Women can have exceptions on Sabbath. And even that word hypocrites, John, I always think it's worth the, the etymology of it's interesting. The, the, the Hippocrates, it literally, mm. like in the ancient society, sort of around about the time of Jesus, that word gets associated. It's a term for actors. So in these big theaters, yeah. the actors would wear these masks to help you identify their role in the play. They put on these large masks so that you could see them better from where your vantage point in these amphitheaters yeah. that we see in the Roman pictures. So, so to, to, to put on something, I mean, the, the whole, it seems to me that the, the Hippocrates language is about judgment and the ability to not be able to judge who the person yeah. is properly because they're here yes. as an actor. And so, so you hypocrites, as Jesus, you're acting here. You, you actually are playing as Torah observant people, but you're using Torah to bring pain and to bring exclusion. And Torah has never been about bringing pain and exclusion. In fact, the opposite. So I think that that critique is hypocrite sounds sometimes in our modern vernacular a little different than what Jesus is saying. Stop being mm. actors around Torah. Mm -hmm. Stop pretending to be something other than what you are. And, and I think that's also what can be quite shaming when you get when you get revealed as an actor <laughs> rather than rather than that, that sure. can be em embarrassing, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think that's all part of that humiliation mm -hmm. and, and, the, and actually the fact that there's no comeback to the argument mm -hmm. of Jesus, that he's absolutely yes. floored them. Yes. I mean, how do you answer that? There is no answer to that. Yes. He's, can I say this carefully? He's beat them at their own game. He's, yes. he's quoted the oral tradition yes. in such a way that it makes any defense of that oral tradition on this issue preposterous. Yes. And you're absolutely right. Jesus never breaks Torah, mm. but he does challenge the traditions and interpretations of Torah. You have heard it said, mm. but I say unto you. And I, and I think it's important for us to recognize. A lot of my doctoral research was into this whole subject of honor and shame dynamics. And, and mm. in the ancient world, to be involved in a verbal spat with someone and to be left unable to answer is in and of itself shameful, right? So if you're finally left going, well, I can't say anything back to that, the observers would realize, oh, you lost. 
<laughs> and therefore, Checkmate. and therefore, you are the one who has been humiliated in the in the engagement. Mm, that's a great great thought. I, j- just just one final reflection, David. We we've lent into this before when we did the parables, but of course, in in my lovely Bible, at the end of verse seventeen, when he said, "This his opponents were humiliated, people delayed it, etc., etc." You get this heading introduced, yeah. which in my Bible says the parables of the mustard seed and the yeast. But verse 18 says, then Jesus asked. Absolutely. It's the same story. And, and <laughs> it's the same story. Then Jesus asked. And of course, what does he ask? He asks, what is the kingdom of God like? Now, I think, so if our, our, our readers, our listeners can imagine, he has probably turned toward the synagogue ruler who may be positioned behind him when he's reading Torah and and is probably answered and I would imagine now he's turning to face <laughs> the the wider audience in that synagogue and he asks them the question so what is the kingdom of God like what shall I compare it to it's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden it grew and became a tree and the birds perched in its branches again he asked what shall I compare the kingdom of God to oh it's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 60 pounds of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. And that's it. He doesn't explain it. And I I think he's linking his message of the kingdom to this miracle. Mm. He's saying this looks like the small seed plant that this looks inconsequential, mm. but this is a seed of the kingdom on the fringe of the fringe of the empire that will grow and outlast Rome's might and strength. Mm. And then, of course, as if to absolutely ram the point home, his final little parable is of a woman <laughs> herself yes, working the yeast into the dough yes. and until it works all the way through the dough. And I think Jesus is saying, what you've seen today is just the beginning of the yeast of the kingdom mm. being worked into the dough, and it's going to change the whole world. So I would encourage our listeners next time they read that story, read through right to the end of of verse 21 and read it as a whole. And you do get a dramatic and even more dramatic climax. Because when it finishes at verse 17, you're almost going, thank God that's over. But it's not over. Mm. And Jesus just goes, okay, while I've got your attention, (laughs) what's the kingdom of God like? And what shall I compare it to? And he rams the point home. Now, I, I want to say, if you are interested in that parable about the woman and the, the 60 pounds of flour, go and listen to episode three of our parable series. Yeah. It's called Flash Parables Part years One. ago we did that. Yeah, all the way back Absolutely. from May. So yeah, Flash yeah. Parables Part One is us actually unpacking that, that parable. So rather than us unpacking the parable again for you just now, Go back and listen to, to that episode of us getting really excited about that. But here's my final thought, John. And I've literally just, this has just struck me just now as you were talking just there. Um, like, what if those two parables are actually the end of the sermon, right? Because because, because Luke 13, verse 10, where where's the story start? Jesus is teaching. Yeah. And and behold, a woman. Mm-hmm. Right? So you, you made the point at the start. It seems like she's interruptive, right? She just appears. Absolutely. So th- yeah. there's almost a sense of which Jesus is going, okay, now that we've done the healing, sorted out the, slow, the small theological differences that we had there, let me get back to my teaching. <laughs> and, I mean, yeah. it's, you can't entirely yeah. prove that. But, you know, but of course, the, the rabbinic model of teaching is very interrogative. It's, it's I'm going to ask some questions. I want you to think about it. I'm gonna... So so there's, it's interesting how the, the interruption becomes the teaching piece, the interruption. As you said, then Jesus asked, right? Okay, so... Um, That's for sure. I'm, 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 I'm kind of uh, building on a little bit of silence there, but, but you definitely get the sense at the start that the teaching is interrupted. Mm. And now you get Jesus, whether it's the end of his sermon, he definitely makes it the end of his sermon. And it's like, well, probably for don't need sure, to say anything else sure. now. How about here's two thoughts and then I'm out. <laughs> yeah. No, no. And of course, it, that would lean into the six part element of the synagogue. So, mm-hmm. the, so the final element of the synagogue service is benediction. In other words, some sort of reference to how good that word was from the <laughs> teacher. Well, that's not going to happen. So the, so, so that's definitely not. So Jesus pronounces his own benediction by <laughs> proclaiming, oh, 
here's the kingdom of God, here's what it yes. looks like, and fasten your seatbelts because this thing's going to rock your world. Yes. And I think he finishes the sermon his own way. I think it's a brilliant insight, absolutely. And what somebody will notice, and I said we wouldn't teach on the parable, but I just need to make this point really quickly because I'm excited <laughs> about it. When you listen to Flash Parables Part 1, you'll notice that we pick up on there being just a little bit of a, an interest that Jesus talks about, this woman who's mixing dough, and she makes these 60 pounds of flour. I mean, it's such a huge amount, right? And and nice. we pointed out in that parable that that's an interesting number because actually back in Genesis, you actually get Abraham and Sarah have these visitors who have come to tell them that they're going to have a son. And Sarah yeah. mixes 60 pounds of flour to make bread for them. Yeah. And because it's such a ridiculous number for three people, let's make... 27 kilos of dough it sticks out so the fact that G, what we say in the in in that previous podcast what we mentioned is that clearly there's an allusion to this coming kingdom the, the, this this yes. way of god that's going to come through abram and his family so again go and listen to that in your own time but just notice that jesus says this woman a daughter of abraham and then he rolls into a parable about a woman, which is an allusion to the story when Abraham is promised a child is coming. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's just there, isn't it? You can feel it in the it's air just that, that Jesus absolutely. is being very clever. <laughs> very, very clever. A very and clever. if you're raised we, on these stories, if you're in the synagogue and you've grown up listening to them, you don't, you don't miss that, right? Absolutely. You don't miss that. You, 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 you excuse the pun, but you, you do catch the breadcrumbs, don't you? <laughs> okay, so that's it for our second text of this week. Thanks so much for listening. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch with either of us about something we said, you can reach out to us on podcast at twotexts.com or by liking and following the Two Texts podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you did enjoy this episode, we'd love it if you left us a review or a comment where you're listening from. And if you really enjoyed the episode, why not share it with a friend? Don't forget, you can listen to all of our podcasts at www.2text.com or wherever you get your podcasts. But that's it for today. We'll be back in two weeks' time with another episode. But until then, goodbye. Goodbye.